Sounds good. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's seminar talk. Today we have the great pleasure to host Petar Belichkovic. Petar is a senior research scientist at DeepMind and obtained his PhD degree in computer science from the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Pietro Leo. His research interests involve devising neural network architectures that operate on non-trivially structured data, such as graphs, and their applications in algorithmic reasoning and computational biology. Petar has published popular work in both machine learning and biomedical venues. And among other work, he's the first author of the Graph Attention Networks paper, a popular convolutional layer for graphs, the Deep Graph Infomax paper, a scalable unsupervised learning pipeline for graphs, and neural execution of graph algorithms, an approach to supervise graph neural nets to imitate outputs of classical graph algorithms. Today, he will talk about his more recent research projects in implicit planning. And um, welcome to the stage, Petal. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and the great introduction, Jean. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for showing up uh, in, uh, in great numbers today for my talk on uh, neural implicit planning and the various ways in which we might go about attacking it. Um, in case you're just joining us, uh, a few minutes ago, Jean and I had a general conversation about whether or not I had previous excursions in RL, and this is something that I've wanted to do for a very long time, even like since starting my PhD, but I never seem to have either the right tools or the right hardware or the right kind of clever ideas to make it happen. So I like to think that using this lens of graph neural networks, neural algorithmic reasoning, we have finally found one possible method where uh, I was able to meaningfully contribute and scope this field. So I hope that the analysis uh, that I'll present to you today and well, our own work in the area will uh, be something interesting for you and something that uh, you can use to drive some of your future research ideas. So without further ado, uh, let's say what is it that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I will be covering neural architectures and some also classical algorithms and maybe fusions between the two for performing implicit planning. And I feel like before we jump into anything specific, we should be very clear about what this concept actually means and what is it that we're actually solving. And then we can try to get into the approaches. So let's first answer one question. Please tell me what are we doing here? Well, um, in case you haven't uh, gone into contact with much reinforcement learning before, it is a very generic uh, problem solving setting where you're an agent depicted by this uh, cute robot here, which uh, has some internal parameters. And then the agent uh, sees a current state of the world and performs a particular action in the world. And the world then responds by updating the state and potentially rewarding the agent in some way. And this is generally designed to go in a sort of control loop that we need to somehow optimize. Uh, specifically, we will be interested in variants of the reinforcement learning setting where there is an explicit planning component. So uh, the agent, rather than just uh, observing things that the world gives and uh, reacting appropriately, will also be able to devise plans to spend some time just thinking about what is the best action to do. And then based on whatever the planning process uh, tells the agent, uh, they will decide what is, the best, uh, what is the best action. So let's try to concretize things in case you haven't seen the terminology before. Uh, the agent is currently in a particular state, S from a set of states and uh, the way in which the agent influences the environment is by performing actions, A, and uh, the environment responds with uh, a scalar reward and the next state, S prime, that the agent should uh, assume next. And uh, the way in which the environment gives these responses is assumed to be governed by a uh, Markov decision process, which is uh, a transition model that specifies probabilities of going to a particular next state S prime given a state in the action, and also a distribution of rewards that the environment will give for performing a certain action in a certain state. And the objective of the agent is to find uh, a great policy 
i.e. a function pi, which will, based on the current state the agent is in, predict what are the best actions that the agent should do. And uh, it should be chosen in a way that it optimizes some notion of cumulative reward. Now, usually to make uh, all the possible infinite sums converge and to also give us a way to trade off immediate rewards versus rewards that happen after many steps in the future, what we actually want the policy to optimize is this notion of discounted cumulative reward, where we basically uh, want to maximize a geometric series of all the rewards that we receive, where the scaling ratio is this discount factor gamma, which is uh, any constant between zero and one. So hopefully this makes it clear what is it that we're doing here. And well, now that we know why we're here, do you have any plans on what we can do? Um, so what's in this policy function that the agent needs to, uh, that the agent needs to drive? If you're going to uh, just do responsiveness to whatever uh, observations you get from the environment, this means your policies are derived purely through adapting to what you observe and they're often called reactive policies. And while they have certainly been the bread and butter of deep reinforcement learning nowadays, uh, they will, in many cases, require huge quantities of data to properly learn how to react because you need to be able to reason about effects over potentially very long trajectories and credit assignment can be difficult, like deciding what were the critical actions that led me to a particular place. And it can also be quite slow to adapt to changing environments. So if I suddenly end up uh, in a great trajectory, which leads me to a new region of space that I have never explored before, and I don't know, the laws of physics change slightly where I am right now, it would take me equally huge amounts of observations and actions in the environment before I can learn to adapt to these new laws of physics. And this is potentially problematic because there are many instances where we would ideally like to apply reinforcement learning, but we don't necessarily can afford interacting with the environment that many times. And planning is uh, what makes this approach uh, actually uh, uh, more feasible and more ameliorated. So what we do in planning is we'll typically maintain this explicit model of the world, which uh, tells us uh, how states transition from other states. So we might imagine this FT function that for a particular state and action input will tell us roughly either what's the next state or what's the probability distribution over next states. And uh, we might also have a reward model that will tell us for a state action pair what is probably going to be the reward we're going to get. And this is something that uh, sometimes we have strong assumptions on what these are going to be. But usually, if we don't have these assumptions, we will train these models from our observed trajectories of interacting with the world. And once you have access to these two models, the transition and reward models, or maybe some other models as well, uh, this planning approach can simulate what happens when you take actions before you ever take them. And I hope that it's somewhat clear that if you do this in a proper way, this can come with huge benefits. So the most obvious one that I also mentioned on the previous slide is data efficiency. If you have a very good model, then you can figure out the outcomes of actions without ever needing to take them in real life. So that means you will have to uh, interact with the environment far less to uh, figure out a good policy. Further, if you have a very strong model of the world, then you can also quickly adapt to ending up in a previously unexplored region of space because you'll be able to, to an extent, anticipate that the laws of physics are going to change and you will update your uh, acting accordingly. Another really great fact of being able to uh, evaluate the effects of actions without actually taking them is that you can now be a much more safer agent. Like imagine that uh, in simulation, you can easily do whatever you want, but if you're controlling an actual physical system, there are certain actions that will break the system. And it will be very nice uh, if you can figure out that an action will destroy your expensive equipment before actually taking that action. And also having models is a very convenient way of accounting for the factors that are not internal to the agent. For example, if you need to interact with human uh, agents or even different uh, synthetic agents, having an explicit model that accounts for what these uh, participants are likely to do is probably going to help you adapt better. And uh, you're probably familiar with some impactful applications of model-based reinforcement learning in both uh, game playing, such as the uh, famous AlphaGo result, 
but also it's seen a lot of application across the sciences. For example, this nature paper from Marwin Segler, which uh, explores the planning approaches for uh, uh, efficient uh, general generation of compounds uh, in the context of drug discovery. And also there are some just theoretical encouragement for why this is a good idea to do, because it can actually be shown that if your model were to be trained to perfection, so if you had an, a perfect model of what the world is, you're actually in a position to plan the perfect policy that can be proved optimal. And in that context, uh, one very common algorithm that arises uh, is value iteration. So value iteration is a dynamic programming algorithm that predicts a value of every state, this V of S. And the way in which it uh, uh, proceeds is by initially assigning an arbitrary value to every state and then updating it one step at a time using the equation that's given at the top. So uh, it's uh, a value in a state is updated by maximizing across all possible actions, the reward uh, of getting, of taking this action in the state, plus the discounted, uh, one step discounted value in the expected state that we end up in. And uh, it can be shown that value iteration is guaranteed to converge to the optimal solution V star, which is the fixed point of the Bellman equations. And uh, then once you have these V star values, you know that you have the optimal policy because you just take actions that would maximize this expected V star. So this is great. We know that there's a theoretical backing behind why having these models of the world is good. But in order to just apply basic value iteration and reach a perfect policy, you would need to have full knowledge of the underlying environment. So you need to know the transition probabilities P and the reward model R, and then you would be able to apply this algorithm. And very often we won't have access to, to these functions, at least not so directly. So that begs the question of if I'm in even a slightly less theoretical environment, how do you even do any plans? So as mentioned, in many cases of interest, these uh, transition and war models will be completely hidden from us. And that means we have to learn them by interacting with the environment. And what we typically mean by this is that we're going to assume that we have access to a data set of all previous interactions we had of, uh, with the environment. These will typically be trajectories of the form where each element of our data set is a four tuple of state, action, reward, next state. So the semantics of this uh, uh, tuple is I performed a particular action in a particular state, the environment responded with some reward and took me to state S prime. And what's convenient about this is that you can even build this data set up as you're learning to act, but you need to be careful to trade off how much you explore the environment versus how much you exploit the good policy, because you need to make sure that your model is actually correct and as unbiased as possible uh, with respect to your uh, actor that collects this data. Um, once we have this data set, we can learn the transition function just by doing supervised learning. So we can make uh, our transition function of, of this state S and action A be as predictive of S prime as possible. And we can do very similar uh, approaches for learning the reward models. So make the output of this uh, reward function of state action be as predictive as possible of the reward and you know, if you have more knowledge about what's the underlying dynamics of the model, you can bake that directly into the way these FT and FR functions are constructed or trained. But here I've sort of given you the tabula rasa approach. Like if you have no upfront knowledge about what are the dynamics of the environment and all you have is uh, trajectories, this is generally the way in which uh, you would proceed. And uh, since we're going to be dealing with neural networks for the most part, uh, it's generally quite attractive if these models will operate in a latent space. So uh, what this means is that we won't be looking necessarily at raw state observations, but we'll be looking at their embeddings into some uh, uh, real valued uh, vector space. So assume that uh, we've applied a neural network. Uh, for example, if our inputs are images, we can apply a convolutional neural network and summarize this uh, input state into an embedding, Z of S, which is a k-dimensional real vector. And now our transition model can model effects in the latent space. So it takes uh, the vector of the current state and it takes a representation of the action that we want to take 
and its effect is to transform this vector z of s so that it's as close as possible to the vector of the state we would land in. And uh, this is quite popular recently because there's been a boom of these self-supervised learning methods recently, and they are very popular in the context of learning this transition model. Uh, especially one popular approach with uh, trajectory data is to use contrastive learning. So try to uh, optimize the T function such that uh, you get as a correct result as possible when going from S to S prime, but get a, as the similar result as possible when going from uh, S to a randomly sampled S tilde. This is very important because if you didn't have this discrimination, uh, one trivial solution for the transition model and the encoder model is to just encode everything into the same vector. And then the transition model can just be an identity function. But this clearly doesn't tell us, while it optimizes the objective, it doesn't really tell us anything useful about the environment. And once you have access to these transition or reward models or both, uh, different planning methods will exploit this information uh, in different ways. So specifically, uh, one way in which you can use these models is to explicitly roll out the model that you have and like starting from the current state, just try a bunch of actions, observe some model rewards and based on these outcomes, decide which action to take. Now, this is something that we typically call model based reinforcement learning and uh, it is obviously a discrete process like there's a bunch of discrete steps that you need to take based on which you will somehow update uh, what your policy is thinking and for that reason, it's not always super trivial to combine it with neural network based optimization, though it is a very uh, popular and commonly used approach in practice that has led to many wins of reinforcement learning. So I'm definitely not trying to uh, cast it in a negative light here, but one uh, fairly recent approach which uh, I have found quite attractive and the one that we will focus on here is uh, learning how to plan implicitly, which leads to implicit planning methods. Now here, we're not going to explicitly roll out uh, our transition and reward model for a bunch of steps and then update a policy based on that. But instead, we're going to bake into our architecture a certain inductive bias or certain training regimes that are going to be uh, aligned with computations of a planning algorithm. But we would still ultimately optimize our predictions using some model-free reinforcement learning loss, such as what you might find in DQN, HRC, PPO, or something like that. And uh, for this reason, sometimes these methods are referred to as model-free planning, although I don't personally like to conflate these two terms because usually uh, like there is a very clear transition model, for example, that's being learned. It's just that uh, it is baked into the weights of a neural network rather than uh, applied externally. What's really nice about uh, learning to plan implicitly is the fact that now you can compose and blend some great ideas and star ideas from model-free reinforcement learning and uh, also combine them with some meaningful explicit thinking time that the model can do and still optimize the whole thing through backpropagation, which means you still have the benefit of latent spaces and uh, robustness that neural networks can sometimes offer. And therefore, it's kind of a best of both worlds approach. Uh, one major challenge that certainly impedes progress in the area is that now you need to design your planning components such that they will uh, be differentiable with respect to whatever reinforcement learning loss function that you want to optimize. And this is clearly a challenge. Like, what do you mean? Plan is a fundamentally discrete process. What do you mean it must be differentiable? So um, what I'm going to do next is show you some different clever tricks and approaches which actually allow us to differentially define the plan. But before doing that, it's good to just give you a little bit of an overview of everything that I've covered so far. So I'm going to assume I have access to a data set of trajectories. Uh, I'm in a state S, I've taken action A, and as a result, that's taken me to a state S prime, and we've observed reward R. Uh, I have color-coded these different nodes so that I can use them more effectively without explicitly writing, this is a state, this is an action, this is a reward. But this is kind of the mental image you should keep in mind. I'm usually representing states as green, actions as blue, and uh, rewards as red. Once I have these, uh, the, these trajectories and the data set of all of my interactions of interest, I can learn these transition and reward models, which will take into account uh, 
uh, state uh, action pairs. So I'm in state S, I'm performing action A. And as a result, we would want to be predictive in the transition model of something relating to the next state, S prime, and in the reward model, something relating to the next reward, uh, R. Now, the idea of implicit planning is that once I have these two models, which I've denoted in blue for the transition model and red for the reward model, uh, I can sort of do a this uh, hybrid neural network architecture that takes the representation of the current state and then uh, implicitly within the weights of the neural network somehow invokes these transition and reward functions to get a feeling for what's in the neighborhood of my particular node and how uh, impactful it is. And uh, as a result of observing all this information, somehow differentially aggregating it and providing access to uh, information necessary for predicting how to act. Now, the important part here is that there is a lot of power to be extracted from combining this central planning component and just uh, standard model-free reinforcement learning, which doesn't explicitly invoke these, uh, these functions. And I've envisioned that here as a sort of skip connection. So my final decision on how to act will be made based on some uh, concatenation of uh, what's inside uh, the uh, state itself and also all the planning computations that I've implicitly performed uh, inside the model. And this skip connection can often be quite powerful for data efficiency uh, as we will discuss uh, later on during this talk. But generally, like whenever I say implicit planning, you should visualize something like this, an end-to-end -end differentiable function taking us from states to usually probability distributions over actions or something like that. And somehow, somewhere within the neural network architecture, we're doing computations that are similar or aligned to rolling out these uh, reward and transition models. Okay, so that sounds like a lot, like a lot of different components that we need to just bake in and make it work. So one common uh, question that you might ask when you're faced with so many moving blocks and knobs that you need to tune is, uh, okay, is it okay for me to maybe start with something that's just a little bit simpler so that uh, I'm, I just might have a bit of an easier time uh, trying to align myself to a planning algorithm? And well, let's for now assume that the answer to this question is yes. And uh, to put this into context, I will focus pretty much explicitly on this update rule of value iteration. So we'll be trying to align ourselves to the planning computations that value iteration is doing. And uh, you can see here from the formula of updating V of S that it uh, relies on uh, considering the immediate successors of a particular state. That's the summation over all S primes, which, are, uh, which have positive probability uh, in the P. And then you need to meaningfully kind of optimize these uh, values across all choices of actions. And what's nice about this is that if you look at the formula for value iteration, in principle, this is something that if I were to plug it in a neural network, I would be able to differentiate it. I'm not doing anything that's uh, uh, very illegal or discreet in terms of propagating signal. Uh, but there is a tricky part in figuring out who are exactly my successors, what are these transition probabilities, and so on. And this is the part where it might get tricky. So uh, what might make sense for us is to start with some special reinforcement learning environments that we all know and love, where determining who is my successor is something that's quite trivial, actually. And uh, I, I would probably already hear some of you saying we should look at grid worlds, because that's kind of the standard thing that we look at when we want to battle test an RL algorithm before actually deploying it on something uh, more tricky or higher dimensional, like uh, Atari, for example. So what's nice about grid worlds? Uh, each state in a grid world has generally pre-specified neighbors. So in this case, imagine my agent is uh, in the green square and uh, it needs to make a decision on where to immediately move. And let's say for the sake of the argument, it can move in the four principal directions. So I know exactly that my four neighboring states uh, are the one at uh, the left, the right, the up, and the bottom. Uh, 
And furthermore, usually we assume that the actions in this setting are deterministic. So if I say I'm going up, it is uh, always without any doubt going to be the case that I will move to the square, which is above me. And what's really nice is that if you then plug these assumptions into the value iteration update rule, uh, what you will effectively get is literally uh, combining uh, different neighboring values to estimate what your value is. So there is going to be some function over my immediate neighborhood in this particular two-dimensional state space that is going to help me determine what my value is and how I should act. And so we've put ourselves on the grid and I've kind of computed the response of a particular position in this grid by looking at uh, what are the immediate neighbors in pixel space in the grid. Uh, well, I would hope that uh, this reminds some of you of something that we use in deep learning every day. And uh, yes, indeed, if you look at value iteration in a grid world, it actually aligns quite nicely with a convolution operation that we might perform in a standard convolutional neural network. So this is quite encouraging. And what's also quite nice is that if we're not in a grid world, but we're just in some generic uh, graph structured Markov decision process. So in this case, there's not a fixed left, right, up, down pixel that I can look at, but maybe there's a certain number of actions and each one of them takes me to some neighbor state in a graph, which I'm aware of. Well, there you still get a nice alignment. It's just that value iteration will now align with uh, graph convolutions rather than uh, image convolutions. So it's a very similar concept, only now we're transforming based on a set neural network that looks at features of a node and its immediate neighbors and uses that to update its state uh, accordingly. Now, uh, for those of you who are aware of my work uh, beforehand, you will probably know that uh, I've done a lot of research on GNNs and as much as I would love it to be, I cannot make this talk about GNNs uh, because there's a lot of other content I need to cover. And that being said, if you are new to the area of GNNs, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the talk I recently gave at Cambridge on uh, theoretical foundations of graph neural networks, which uh, is a one hour long introduction on all the basics from the ground up, all the applications like motivating you why you should be studying this in the first place, and also relating it to so many contexts on where these methods have emerged in the first place. It's publicly available on YouTube and uh, I will be, of course, sharing the slides afterwards as well, but you can also find this link uh, everywhere like on my uh, Twitter channel or YouTube channel or otherwise. But moving on, like we will treat graph neural networks here as basically a black box. So now if you're in a grid world or in this graph world and uh, you have this nice assumption that uh, the structure of your environment is discrete, fixed, and known up front, then value iteration just pops up by performing a shared convolutional layer in your neural network, either a uh, pure convolutional neural network for grid worlds, which is what the original value iteration network paper studied, by the way, this uh, paper won the best paper award in, in Europe's 2016. So it's quite, uh, it was quite an impactful approach, which kind of uh, kicked off an avalanche of implicit planning methods. And uh, there's been obviously some studies that tried to then extend it further to cases where your environment is still fixed and known, but it's no longer a grid. Instead, it's a more generic graph of transitions and the generalized value iteration networks from uh, new and others uh, have basically performed that extension and that expanded the application space of these models. Um, however, I, I hope that it's fairly obvious that by doing all of this, I have made some very strong assumptions about my environment. And, uh, you know, ideally, we should relax these constraints as soon as possible. Um, so let's see. We've so far only looked at these known worlds. So assuming that our environment is fixed and known, which was quite helpful for us. We never needed to estimate transition models. It was kind of implicit in how the environment was given to us. And we never had to deal with uh, continuous state spaces. Like we assumed we were in a grid world, a pixel perfectly corresponded to the position of the agent and something like that. So now let's see what we might do if these uh, constraints are not satisfied. So if our NDP is not fixed, not known, or, and we have to learn from potentially high dimensional or continuous data. Uh, 
what we will often do and what the papers I'm about to present to you are definitely doing is to relax these constraints, we'll have to learn an explicit transition model. And to account for the fact that the inputs could be very high dimensional, we use the previously mentioned idea of learning a transition model in an embedding space. So there's a transition function T, which takes a state embedding, which is a real valued vector that represents the current state you're in and a representation of an action. And uh, based on that predicts uh, uh, what should be the representation of the resulting state. If you do things in this way, uh, you may be able to basically construct a local environment or a local MDP around your current state. And uh, I've already mentioned in previous sections, there's these cool semi-supervised, self-supervised learning approaches and contrastive learning that can allow you to learn such a transition model purely through interactions with the environment. So once you have this transition function, what you can do is, as I mentioned, expand this locality around the particular node. And this can give you a local graph structure that you can hopefully use to perform some planning computations. So here, for example, if I'm given this high dimensional frame from the Atari game freeway, uh, which is my state S, I can apply a convolutional neural network Z to transform it into a flat vector representation H of S. And then once I have that, I can perform uh, planning by expanding what all of my neighboring states are going to be by just applying the transition model from this state embedding and applying uh, different actions to construct the latent graph. Now, what I'm going to focus on is the most simple strategy possible for constructing this, which will be exhaustive breadth for search. So in every state, try every possible action to expand. Now, this has an obvious problem in that it really will not scale if your action space is large or your thinking time is large because the number of nodes you're sampling this way is uh, on the order of size of action space to the power of uh, the thinking time. And that obviously will not uh, work for a very long time. And while this like short thinking time, small action space actually works out quite well for some environments like Atari, uh, I would say that in the general case, it's not going to be enough. And you should always keep in mind that we can find more interesting rollout policies, ones that decide which actions to actually expand. Uh, and one possibly uh, cool avenue for deriving these rollout policies is by looking at, for example, what does a good model-free policy do in this state and try to distill that into the uh, operations that into the actions that uh, are being expanded. But uh, for now, we will just assume that we're doing breadth for search to simplify the overall analysis. Um, and now further, I've only talked about transition models so far, but we can also assume that we have certain reward or value models that will give us uh, scalar values in every node that we've just expanded. And, but now look at what we've done. We've constructed ourselves a local uh, environment graph around our current state. And for every single node in this state, we actually have a notion of reward and a notion of value, which actually allows us to directly apply value iteration. So uh, over the edges that we just expanded and the rewards and values we predicted using some additional models, we can actually directly estimate these Q values, which uh, correspond to the utility of taking a particular action in a particular state. And then once you have these Q values, you can directly decide the policy based on them. So just choose whichever Q value, uh, whichever action maximizes the Q value. And this is exactly the approach that's leveraged by models such as TreeQN and A3C. And uh, there's, I should also mention that there is a wider family of models that uh, rely on these uh, expansions followed by uh, reward models and directly applying an update rule. And uh, the value prediction networks from Europe 17 are also a strong example of, uh, of this particular approach. So what happens here in action? Here I've just used the figure from the original TreeQN paper, but uh, uh, to kind of summarize everything I mentioned, we start with the state ST. Our encoder function encodes it in a latent space. Uh, in this case, they denote it with Z. And we try every possible action. So in this case, actions one, two, and three. And our transition model gives us what are the possible embeddings of the neighboring states. And we can do it further. So if you have two steps of thinking time, you can then further apply the transition model uh, on those three resulting states to get the nine different neighbors of neighbors. 
Once you have that, you can use your value model to estimate the value in each one of these nodes and then explicitly perform the value iteration over these values, uh, which uh, is kind of encapsulated in these backup boxes. And this result uh, gives you Q values for every possible action. And you can then select the action which optimizes the Q value. So this is a very nice way that seemingly allows us to apply value iteration in a way that's differentiable and give us an implicit planner that will in principle work on generic environments. Uh, but there is one more issue that I think could become quite important, especially if we care about data efficiency. So let's think a little bit about what we've just done and how it might actually introduce some bottleneck style problems. So let's take a recap and realize what we've done so far when we've used models such as A3C. So we've started with our natural inputs. These are, for example, matrices of pixels in the case of Atari. And we've used the neural network, like a convolutional neural network, and the reward model to map these inputs to a space of abstract inputs. And now these abstract inputs are uh, abstractified enough that I can directly apply a value iteration algorithm on them. So what we've computed from our pixel states and our transition and reward models is a local Markov decision process. So a local uh, graph structure where in every node we have reward values and uh, different notions of value. And this was then enough for us to just apply an update rule to those nodes. Now, as mentioned before, the value iteration update itself is differentiable. So the fact that we applied it doesn't make any difference. We can very easily backpropagate through uh, what we've just done. So this sounds great. This sounds like it fixes all of the issues that uh, the original value iteration networks had in terms of generalizing to unknown NDP structures. But there is this bottleneck problem that I think should be given attention. It's because like when you look at real world data, like the magnitude of the pixel values that you might get in a, in a video game state or the density of signal that you might get in a real world control problem, real world data is often incredibly rich. And in the process of doing all of this, like taking them to an embedding and then taking that embedding down to scalar rewards, we've done a whole lot of compression. So we've taken all this rich complexity in the real world and we've kind of squished it down to just a single scalar. And then the value iteration algorithmic solver will commit to using the scalars you've given it. And because algorithms come with strict preconditions, postconditions, proofs of correctness, the algorithm will usually assume that whatever you've given it is perfect. And I mean, you can imagine what happens if there is not enough training data to be very proper about what these scalars actually are. It, we're actually going to hit data efficiency issues again. Whereas your VI algorithm will give you a perfect solution for the scalars you've provided it, but these scalars are not optimally modeling the kinds of dynamics that you actually want in your environment. And as a result, the final plan that you get is not optimal. Now, of course, if you allow yourself to observe uh, enough data to properly estimate these scalars, you will be able to solve this issue. But uh, data efficiency is to an extent the reason why we're doing model-based uh, uh, planning in the first place. So it would be great if we can try to fix this bottleneck issue in uh, any way possible. And one possible approach to breaking the bottleneck relies on using just the representational power of neural networks. Neural nets derive a lot of flexibility from having these high dimensional latent representations because with scalars, as I mentioned, if you get the scalar wrong, it's pretty much game over. But if you mess up any component of a neural network's latent representation, it is still not infeasible that other parts of it can step in and compensate for those mistakes. <clears throat> so in order to break the scalar bottleneck, what we could do is replace this hard-coded value iteration update with a neural network that operates over high dimensional spaces and somehow aligns with value iteration. So note the difference. Previously, we mapped natural inputs with the neural network to abstract inputs for an algorithm. Now we just map to a latent state and we learn a separate neural network that meaningfully operates on this latent state such that uh, the outcomes of value iteration are decodable from the output. 
And uh, as before, because we're building these local MDPs and uh, value iteration and graph-based MDPs aligns well with graph neural networks, we will use graph neural networks for this uh, additional neural network component. So if you were to just slot in a graph neural network in place of a value iteration and then optimize the whole thing end to end, this will in principle align with value iteration, but could put a lot of pressure on the planning component because now you're having a gradient signal that is supposed to at the same time drive your uh, policy values, uh, drive uh, the correctness of graph construction. Remember that the embeddings that come out of your encoder also need to properly feed into the transition model. And also you wanted to align to value iteration computations and there's no explicit incentive for the network to do exactly that. So this generally results with not that interesting results in practice. So what we found was very helpful to alleviate this issue is to actually pre-train the graph neural network just to do value iteration style computation over uh, many Markov decision processes that we can generate synthetically and that are full, fully specified so that we can just imitate the rollouts of value iteration on them. And then once we have this GNN component that uh, in a high dimensional space does something value iteration like, we can deploy it uh, within our planning uh, architecture. The specific concept we're exploiting here uh, is the recently proposed algorithmic alignment idea from K. Luxu and others which uh, uh, mandates that if you take components of your neural network such that they algorithmically align with the underlying procedure you want to simulate, then you're going to have a much better sample complexity to learn them and also much better extrapolation properties. And uh, this actually further motivates why you would use a graph neural network to model all of this. Uh, here at the bottom, I've given the generic equation of value iteration on top and the typical equations of a graph neural network at the bottom. And I've just drawn perfect mappings between different components of the value iteration update and the different variables and computations involved uh, in the graph neural network. So in a way, the graph net really aligns very nicely with value iteration. And uh, further, rather than just the theoretical framework of algorithmic alignment, there's also been a lot of work recently on uh, prescribing how to build graph neural networks so that they will extrapolate nicely. And uh, uh, I've summarized a lot of these prescriptions uh, in the neural execution of graph algorithms paper, which uh, I've co-authored and published at uh, last year's iClear. So what happens when we put all of these components together? So as before, we had a state, which was like pixels of the Atari game. <clears throat> we encoded them into a flat representation HS. Then using our uh, transition model, which we also learn, we're able to expand a local neighborhood around the particular state. In this case, just breadth first fashion, try every possible action for a certain thinking time, uh, which corresponds to depth. And now here is where we start to differ from A3C. Once we have built this graph, we apply a graph neural network over these latent states in the graph. And this graph neural network was pre-trained and frozen such that it imitates the computation of a value iteration. So as a result, we have a latent space to latent space model, which ideally should make uh, value iteration results decodable from the latents. And this gives us these chi vectors which are informed of what's going on in the neighborhood in terms of value estimations. And finally, we can just, uh, as I mentioned before, the skip connection is a very powerful tool for potentially allowing for more model free learning before you're really confident about your model. So what we do is we concatenate the original state embedding HS with the uh, uh, updated state embedding chi -S, which is mindful of the values estimates. And then from the concatenation of those two, we predict the policy, we predict the value function, and we predict anything else that uh, a reinforcement learning algorithm might need. And this is all summarized in our executed latent value iteration network or XSELVIN paper, which uh, last year we published at the NeurIPS uh, Deep uh, Reinforcement Learning Workshop. So just to summarize all the different components that are part of XSELVIN, we have the encoder, which maps state space to real vectors, and that gives you these latent representations of states. We have this uh, transition model, which takes uh, representations of states and a particular action representation, and based on that, computes how the latent space will change as a result of taking this action. 
<clears throat> and this system is pre-trained and fine-tuned based on some standard self-supervised losses, such as trans C, which we use in this paper. And then we have this executor GNN, which takes um, a representation of a particular state, representations of all of its immediate neighbors, and updates the representation such that the outcomes are uh, mappable or decodable to what the actual value iteration algorithm would do if there were just scalar values in there. And once again, as mentioned, to avoid overly pressurizing the latent state of this executor, um, we typically rely on uh, uh, pre-training it to execute value iteration on synthetic Markov decision processes of interest. And after that, we can freeze the computations. And finally, once we concatenate the encoder representations and the executor representations, we can uh, compute action probabilities, state values, or anything else that we need for reinforcement learning given these embeddings. And in this particular case, we use the proximal policy optimization or PPO as our policy gradient method. And I've just here given the basic conclusion from uh, our work in terms of the discussion. So what we've done with all this construction work is built an architecture that is end-to-end -end differentiable, doesn't really assume anything on the structure of the underlying MDP, and it has the capacity to perform computations that directly align with value iteration. So we can think of it as basically a generalization of VIN-like models to settings where the Markov decision process is not provided or otherwise difficult to obtain. And uh, I do realize that once again, I didn't really go in depth into how we actually train the executor, which might be the most exciting component of the whole architecture. But that's partly because this idea of algorithmic reasoning is something that I've been pushing out and talking about a lot in recent talks. So um, there are several resources that I've given before on how do we build good latent space executors. And in particular, these two previous talks that I've given at the WWW and KDD workshops could be excellent starting points and both of them are already publicly available. So if you're interested in learning more about how to build good graph neural network executors, I would probably recommend starting with these two talks, which give a very broad and focused overview of just this one component of our system. <clears throat> and finally, if you'd like to learn more about the generic idea of algorithmic alignment and how we can build graph neural networks, not just for aligning to algorithms, but also generally supporting combinatorial optimization uh, uh, pipelines. We've recently put out a very long 43-page survey on graph neural networks for combinatorial optimization. And in particular, if you want to focus on the algorithmic component of this, which this uh, excellent paper is also based on, you can find a lot of interesting motivations and comprehensive references uh, in section 3.3 of this paper. So I realized that, you know, having introduced VINs and A3C first, there wasn't really that much to say about how Excel VINs work because most of the components were already in place. And I've just kind of slotted in this uh, uh, convenient way of doing valid iteration in the latent space. So this only now leaves the question, did our final plan work out? Did we manage to obtain representations that are more data efficient? And here we have a lot more results in our uh, uh, workshop uh, paper, but I've kind of outlined the three main results that we had in low data Atari environments, uh, which can be a pretty good, uh, pretty good starting point. Uh, specifically in uh, uh, Freeway, Alien, and Enduro, which are three games which might require certain elements of uh, forward thinking. We have found uh, in the front row, you see the comparison of our Exelvin models uh, in uh, green and orange against the um, baseline model-free PPO agent, which has exactly the same architecture as us, but doesn't have the uh, differentiable uh, transition executor combination. And you can find that in all three of these environments, our model is more data efficient. This is plotted over the first uh, million transitions and we're generally always able to achieve better rewards earlier on uh, in the training process. And uh, I'm particularly also keen on the lower three curves, which for all three of these games show our comparison against A3C. As I mentioned, A3C is doing essentially the same thing as us with the difference that uh, they're explicitly 
uh, applying the value iteration algorithm over scalar values, which incurs a bottleneck. And this means that uh, if they haven't seen enough data to properly estimate those scalars, they might actually struggle because the algorithm won't give them meaningful answers. And what we observe in the reward curves sort of mirrors this. Uh, over the first million transitions, usually, except maybe for Enduro, A3C, which is the red curve, doesn't manage to, uh, does manage to catch up to our model. Uh, but over the first like 500,000 uh, transitions or so, our model consistently is able to reach higher rewards earlier, which shows once again that there is a benefit to allowing a bit of model-free cues to come into your planning procedure. And also generally planning in the purely latent space can be meaningful uh, in comparison to compressing everything to scalars and uh, hoping that the scalars are going to be correct. So um, on that note, uh, this was basically the last slide I had. I'd like to thank you so much for uh, listening. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, all of my collaborators on the excellent paper, especially uh, Andrea Deac, who was the lead author, and uh, also uh, uh, my colleagues from DeepMind, Jess, Ferial, and Charles, who've helped me in various aspects of preparing this talk. It was actually my first RL talk ever. So uh, I'm really keen to hear how, uh, how well I've covered some of these topics and how well it was received. And generally, uh, I would be keen to answer questions, both online and offline. You can find me at my uh, uh, Google email or all of my social networks are available uh, on my website. So thank you so much for listening once again. And I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.